You good, missus? I'm good. All right. Roy Firestone in the house. Push Yay. in the button. My goodness, Mrs. Ryan, what's happening? Oh my! Hello, hello! Welcome back. Hello. <laughs> oh, hello. Uh, <laughs> you just can't get away from Seinfeld. It is in our DNA. Thank you, Jerry Seinfeld. Thank you, Larry David. Hi, Mrs. Ryan. Hello, Welcome hello. back. Oh, this is exciting. It's good to be I back. Know. It feels like it's been a long time. I we know. say that all the time. All right, we got to get better at this. Sorry. <laughs> Hi, Mrs. Ryan. Welcome back to you. Welcome back, everybody else, to the old late night playset. Today is Wednesday, October thirtieth. 2019, tomorrow's Halloween. Holy smokes. We have got a great show for you this evening. Roy Firestone is here. You probably know him from uh, from sports, from comedy, from variety shows, from Jerry Maguire. Uh, one of the best interviewers of all time. And uh, we're very, very excited to have him here today. So It's going to be pretty rad. Yeah, I think so. I hope so. I'm going to enunciate better. <laughs> <laughs> Out of practice. Uh, also, your MS. We talked about that one day very quickly. Um, that's part of your MS as well, swallowing and getting the back of the yeah. palate to work and all that stuff. Yeah, it's one of those weird things that like we don't talk about often. It gets speech and vocal vocalizing things and getting words to come out as you want them to are a tricky situation. <laughs> yeah, it is. My goodness, um, I don't. I don't know how you deal with it. I don't know how you deal with it. Thank you for teaching me patience. That's uh, we're doing. all working on that. <laughs> That's a daily struggle for everybody. Um, we've got so much stuff to get through here. Let's keep it right on the script, Mrs. Ryan. Yeah. Um, the hellos first. Let's talk about the weekend. We had a breakfast club that was quite lovely. Um, I don't remember. I think it was kind of non-eventful. I don't remember anything happening. Do you? No. no it was good. Nothing it was nice, nice turnout, I believe. The open, the, the road. Oh, was that's open. what it was. The road was open again. That's oh, all I Highway 2 was open. Oh, wait. That's what happened. A lot of stuff. <laughs> Everything's gotten erased. All right. Newcombs wasn't open. So oh, right. we ended up, uh, it, it, there was like three different <laughs> breakfast clubs. There was an early one, and we all went to, uh, kept going to Wrightwood, and we went to the Bigfoot, uh, not the Bigfoot Cafe. Grizzly. Uh, Grizzly Cafe. And then uh, we came back the same way. We had planned on, oh, we'll all go to the highway. And then we said, but the drive was so nice. And they just freshly bladed it. So it's going to be even nicer on the way back. So we ended up taking the two all the way to Wrightwood and all the way back. That was a fantastic Friday outside. Thanks. I, I was exhausted when we got home. That's for sure. Because <laughs> we hit Newcombs on the way back, too, because the professor and Derek Whitaker and a few people were still there doing their own thing. It was a really good time. It was a hell of a day. And it was one of those where it was really cool because it was like life zig. Whenever life zigs, we zag. I learned that in New York with the traffic. <laughs> I can't believe I'm making that association, <laughs> although it's true. Uh, but it was kind of neat. It was just one of those go with the flow days, lemonade all over the place. And, and the breakfast at Grizzly was great. We had so much fun. Six people over there, I think. A lot of fun. Yeah. Um, all right. So there was that. Then on Saturday, we did the Malibu and Muffins with Marco and Tiege. And that was also great photos by Tiege. Um, really great just to have a chill, enjoyable day on the porch where there wasn't a whole lot going on. It was so quiet and beautiful up there. A couple it things that happened awesome. at the same time. Yeah, it was. this was one of those weird weekends where it was splintered with wonderful, great times and then peppered with awful bad news left and right. And um, one of the things we figured out while we were out there was that uh, somebody very close to us, his father died this week. And that upset us quite a bit at the time because we were with the person and it was just, you know, emotions get real. And as we were there talking about that, we found out that somebody else had a, a son pass away. And, um, and that was somebody that we all knew. And that was very hard to take. Yeah. And uh, Heavy mu weekend. much love to the Lynch family. Very much love from the Ryans to the Lynch family. We are so terribly sorry for your loss. Awful, awful. Um, but my goodness, thank God the community is coming back to them and, uh, and you know, just all showing their love. And uh, oof, it just really took the wind out of our sails. Uh, with that, then we had a great day, great drive, and uh, uh, and then Sunday, Sunday, okay, it was going to be, we thought it was going to be uh, Los Angeles Cars and Coffee, um, and when we went down to the garage, we had found out that not only our garage, but the yellow car had been broken into and uh, vandalized and whatever, not vandalized, but, uh, you know, everything thrown about a muck and stuff stolen and stuff like that, so uh, we were dealing with that Sunday morning, and then... Uh, <laughs> I don't want to start anything because there's already controversy about it. But we went to uh, w w a different car show. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Uh, and apparently some feathers were ruffled. I, I'm, 
very sorry to the Cars and Coffee Los Angeles guys uh, that we didn't stay at the event. Um, what it comes down to for us was we've already had a shitty weekend and enough is enough. And then we got there and it just was a little bit different. And the options were all very far away to park and we didn't pre-register. That's on us. Sorry about that. Um, and it was just a thing. It was We looked at the whole thing very quickly and it was park over there, things here. We can't do that, but there's other things we can do that we're looking for today. So let's just go. Um, so sorry for any drama. It was none intended on our part. We love you guys. We always have. We've always supported you. Um, Matt Farah did show up after we invited him on the show uh, to come. So um, the the event looked wonderful. I'm sorry we didn't uh, partake in it, um, but I felt the need to say some of that stuff because it became a kerfuffle on the social media, and it's like, we're not those people. <laughs> we're, we're not, not. the people that make a stink about that stuff. It was, it was, the option was not good for us. That's all it was. And I'll go on record right now and say walking is really hard for me, and I'm not always nice about it. So, so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, with that, we have a lovely video from that day, Mrs. Ryan, because uh, as we do, we make lemonade. We left thinking there was no big issue at all, and we went on to have a great day, which we did. So here it is. Roll it out. Mrs. Ryan. So we started the day. We were trying to go to uh, Los Angeles Cars and Coffee. Uh, that didn't happen today. They've got some sort of a fancy car. I don't know what's going on, but it was a whole different thing. And you had to, I don't know, it's a different thing. Anyway, so what we did was we ended up taking a drive. We ended up up at Newcomb's. And now we're in Kermit, which is a 72, 73. Oh, and now the owner of Kermit is getting in the yellow car. <laughs> I love it. So I guess we're going to go for a little drive. Okay, Mrs. Ryan? Yeah. Pretty good, eh? <laughs> really? Really? I should have asked you that first. What's up, Mrs. Hello, good morning. How's that yellow car going? How polite, my goodness. Listen to that from the air pit, the pistons and the brakes. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you did. <laughs> hey, babe, what are you doing? Uh, Ian's letting us take Kermit for a spin, and we're having a blast. But I guess it's only fair, because Ian's in yellow car. All right, you ready to go back up to Newcombs? Yes. All right. Ian, how about you? Good, babe. See you in a few. All right, we're back. What do you think, Mrs. Ryan? Pretty good drive. The yellow car's back, too. Yeah, 
misses. That guy is so neat. Ian? Yeah. And that car. I know. That was fun. That was fun. We had a great day. We had a great day. We had a great day. Yeah. (laughs) Pretty (laughs) spectacular. Sorry, some people didn't, but we had a great day. Uh, Let's see. All right, Mrs. Ryan, moving right along here. I only have a quick East Coast feed to do. Okay. And then I believe I'm turning it over to you. So this one's quick. East Coast feed, checking in with Danbury Chive. I believe we are at Ridgefield BMW in Ridgefield, Connecticut. Roll it out. Morning, Mr. and Mrs. Ryan. Big Kenny's here. We're at work. It is Halloween week. I'm wearing my Halloween tie. A little twick or tweet. And just like usual on Route 7, we have an accident right in front of the dealership every day. Um, and they won't let us put in a light because it's a state road. But what's really funny about this is that both cars are actually stuck together. And the tow trucks are trying to take them apart. Let's see if you can see that right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're trying to pull them apart. Two different tow trucks. It's pretty damn funny. There's your East Coast feed for the morning. Hope you guys are having a great day and a better day than all those people in line in traffic, as you can see on Route 7, because it's a oh. shit show. <laughs> Love you guys. God, I grew up with that. I know what he's dealing with there. That is, Route oh. 7 is there. I was in the Wilton side, you know, and then Lime Rock, uh, the other, all the way up on top. So it's like, travel that road. Thorough. Yeah, oh. and it's between, you know, the Norwalk and Danbury, basically, that stretch there. Ooh, hell of a thing. All right, Mrs. Ryan, it's Jeez. time to ask the question that's on everyone's mind. <laughs> What's going on, Mrs. Ryan? Da, da, da. Oh, that camera's awful. Well, whatever. Da, 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 dun, dun, da, 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 <laughs> Take it away. I won't get too medically because I uh, don't know enough about what I want to say sometimes. <laughs> but um, this jumped out at me this morning. The autism spectrum. Mm-hmm. What used to be autism to whatever Asperger's, Asperger's yeah, whatever. It's a spectrum, I believe. Now it's a spectrum, but what they're finding, they're doing a ton of studies now, like everyone is. Yay, thanks. Um, but they're finding that uh, the gene, the autism can be caused sometimes by a mutation in the genes that create myelin, which is what causes my disease when it comes away. That's hysterical. I just read, <laughs> I read schizophrenia, the same thing this morning. It's the I, same thing, the lack of myelin. Yeah. I think it's all a spectrum. They're just like no just starting to pull things back, but it's like where you sort of believed that certainly within the anti uh anti anti immune. No, what am I saying? Auto immune. Certainly all within the autoimmune uh, family, you feel that they're all connected. Yeah, this just adds more credence to that theory of like it's all parts of the same thing, and like where it goes off the rails is really what the diseases are about. Yeah. Well, it's interesting to look at because if we can figure out how to do the myelin thing, that solves so many problems. Yeah, it's a fascinating thing. Um, so all the fires, blah, 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 tons of bad, weird stuff <laughs> is happening here. I, I don't want to go into it because it's nuts. Yeah, but, I, don't, I don't know any area that we don't have somebody who has had to evacuate, except it, for us here. Thank God. But yeah, it's all over. Um, In the meantime, though, part of what people are often afraid of is like, we have animals, but what are we going to do? And VCA is an animal uh, veterinary facility in California. They have 167 167 locations out here, so it's a chain. But they're taking in animals for boarding for free. Oh, that's For the fire, to help with the fire evacuations and all that stuff. Luckily, there are locations everywhere. So if they're not, is it specific locations? No. Great, so you can just go to a VCA. Yeah, VCA is like, we've got locations everywhere. Just bring us your animals, so have a look at that. that's a great one. Similarly, separately, but similarly, in the Uber community in uh, Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, one Uber, of the, the car thing. Yeah, yep. the car thing. Right. Um, everyone's just helping everyone, and I find it so heartwarming and touching that like people are finally seeing outside of themselves. It's Uber's her second job, mm. and she noticed a pickup was like at a children's hospital. And the and the woman was like wanted to go get clothes for her kid that was in the children's. And the woman, the Uber driver, bought everything. Was like, this is crazy. Huh. Life is hard for everyone. Here you go. Wow. Like, let's just here you go. So kudos. Everyone's just looking out, and it makes me so happy. Um, good feel good stories today, Mrs. Ryan. Yeah, it's I'm getting so warmed up about it. Um, but similar, lastly, this just made me laugh so hard. In Arizona, there is a one-ton boulder that's gone missing for two weeks. <laughs> Are they expecting it to return? A one-ton boulder? The national park put out a, an alert. Oh, just, from it, a national park. Oh, yeah. I see. So yeah, because you're not allowed to take. You're not. I don't know how you 
how a one ton boulder gets misplaced or I don't know who needs a one ton boulder but I don't gosh know. that's not what we're getting to the bottom of today it's not the first <laughs> one to go missing they're usually in the thousands of pound range but like so what are we doing is there an all points bulletin for this for this they boulder? put it, the the national park service put out an alert so right. they just so if you, to, see anybody like, driving if you know around any with information suspicious, suspicious rock on the back of their truck if you know any information pop right. out where is it you said arizona arizona all right Oh, and <laughs> order up. <laughs> and that's been What's Going On, Mrs. Ryan. <laughs> Good job, Mrs. Ryan. Holy smokes. All right, the last thing we need to do real quick just to get out of the way is... That's right. It's Dave Watch. Today is the 30th of October. I am putting an X on this date to denote that Mr. David Letterman is not sitting in that chair. However, uh, we have no new news, but we're still in the in the chase. Yep, Mrs. Ryan got to the guy. The guy got to Dave. Now we're waiting for Dave. So it's a matter of if he wants to do it or not. It's all in the hopper. Like it's now in we're hopper. in the waiting game. That's it. And and we've been advised to all we can do is just keep keep working. We just got to keep your nose down to the however that works to the thing, and then you keep on, and you don't look up, and then all of a sudden you look up, and uh, wow, we're way further down the road than we thought we were. How about that, Mrs. Ryan? That's all right. <laughs> if you're good, it's time to take a break and get our guest in here, Mr. Roy Firestone. We are so excited to talk to him. More to come right after this. <laughs> Jimmy Stewart is here. What can you say about this man? Uh, he's, he's a marvelous actor, and he's just a marvelous person. Um, and he does the best impression of Jimmy Stewart I've ever heard of. <laughs> Would you welcome Jimmy Stewart? I can't think of anybody I'd rather start New Year's with than you well, as a guest. I, Good I, to see I, you. Johnny, I, I, I feel the same way. Yeah, Happy New Year. Did you make any resolutions? Johnny, this is a poem about my New Year's resolution. Oh, yes. <laughs> I was trending while friending on, on Instagram <laughs> after updating my Facebook and blog. <laughs> but when I Googled and hulu on Roku, <laughs> I, I felt I was in some sort of fog. <laughs> my Gmail and hard drive wouldn't back up. <laughs> so I streamed my old pick from Netflix in my cloud. <laughs> well, now my downloads won't upload. <laughs> and my flash drives in crash mode. <laughs> and my login and password were disallowed. <laughs> I got a terabyte in my Dropbox. And my tweets froze on Firefox. <laughs> And my Wi-Fi network is blocked. <laughs> my cookies have stopped me from browsing. And my damn server just locked. <laughs> so what is my domain? My passcode, my, my screen name. I don't remember my mother's date of birth. Now, I'm not one to complain, but this web world is insane. And my engine is tired of search. <laughs> Off grid's my goal. Want to reboot my soul? <laughs> I'll yank my wiki <laughs> from Yammer and Yelp. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> I don't care about the app. I'm going to take a nap. And I don't need online help. <laughs> Thank you, Jimmy. Johnny. Happy New Year. We had, we, there, was, there was a lot of paperwork and a lot of right. news to jump through. But, wow. Uh, well, I'm honored because I... 
been on this set. You have. Well, that's it, everybody. We're sitting here with Roy Firestone. Let's get it started up, man. Now, where, which Thank you so right much here? for being here. Absolutely. Okay. This is you right here. Oh, well, great. Look at that. <laughs> if you want to see what your shot is over there, we'll just get it right up there. Oh, right? I see. I see. This there is great. <laughs> Beautiful. So it's so, almost like a talk show inside out. Yeah. You know what I mean? We're doing all the same stuff without the crew and the I whole I love bit. that you direct your own show, too. I'm it's pretty cool. Dave and Hal in one shot, right? Yeah, I love it. How so great. you did do Letterman. Four but, times. Yeah. And, and the oh, old we're show. We're on now. We're right now. We're on. Okay. We're great. on. Yeah. We've been well, on the this whole is, This set here, folks, is a, kind of sentimental to me because while I wasn't a regular regular, I was on frequently and uh, four times, as I mentioned. And uh, Dave first met me. Um, well, I knew Dave way back in like '77 when he was the MC at the co the comedy cl store. Yeah, on Sunset. And with uh, people, you know, people like Andy Kaufman and Jay uh, and, and Jeff Altman, who is still one of his close friend and friends. And I knew Jeff very the very beginning when I first came to LA. Really? Because the truth is, so and funny. now it can be told, I really had a dream of being a stand-up. And I didn't have the chops, I don't think. Although I still am doing it today. I'm performing. I do variety. I sing. I do vocal impressions. I tell stories. But that was my dream. So I used to hang out at the comedy store with Jeff and some people like it. In the very beginning, I saw this guy. And it's interesting that people talk about his beard now. Letterman's beard. Yeah. yeah. Because in 77, he had a beard too, but it was brown. <laughs> but he looked like a lumberjack. He had overalls. And he used to really? come, he used to come out and do five or ten minutes. And I thought he was hysterical, but he was really not a standard stand-up guy. He was sort of the host, the MC. Why did you think he was funny? What was it about him being that he wasn't a traditional stand-up? I just thought he was wry and snarky mm. and dark and playful and goofy. And That's also, hard to balance, it's, it dark is. and it's, playful it's, it's, and it's, goofy. It, dark and playful is a real tough combination. But he had, there was something to him that was quick-witted. Mm. Um, he reminded me a little of Steve Allen, actually, oh, and who was another. I'm sure, idol. he would love that. Yeah, he would. I idolized Steve Allen, and you know, people who are watching this maybe don't even know who the hell Steve Allen is, which is incredible. Well, luckily, I sure do. Right. So, which version of Steve Allen would you associate with? Could have been any number. I like the, the hijinks. I like the pranks. I like the crazy Steve Allen. I like so more the Westinghouse show. Probably. Jump, yes, jumping into a vat of Jello and chocolate pudding and. Um, you know, crazy, wild stuff. Man on the street. Do you remember the flagpole? The, oh, the playing the oh, piano up on the flagpole. I mean, th this <laughs> on guy on Hollywood Boulevard. No, this joke. guy was absolutely. I'm talking about Steve Allen right now. To me, the greatest, most important late night talk show figure oh. of them all, including Johnny, because Steve was. T took a lot of other things he, in his career. He took his musicianship, his jazz, his interviewing styles, his intellect, but he combined it. Remember I said before about dark and playful? Yes. He could do dark and playful too, but he was zany. He was willing to take chances, and I think Dave mm -hmm. more or less drew from that. So he reminded me a lot of Steve, and those were two, two of my biggest heroes from the very beginning. Uh, when I say very beginning in the case of Dave, 1980 I think was the, the morning show on NBC. Yeah, I think you're right. And so that's, you know, that's almost 40 years ago, too, if you think about it. It will be 40 years <laughs> next year. I was going to say, I don't have to think that it's hard, Roy. Wild. You're exactly right. <laughs> it's wild. But so, so anyway, long story short, Dave got wind of the fact that I had done a Keith Jackson impression. He heard me on the Larry King show. And, you know, do a little Keith Jackson. You talk like this. Ah, you always talk like, oh, boy, I tell you, we've got a red barn burner for you. Yes, and then they do it, and he rolls around the right side. And, bum, 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 and he does dying. that He does that whole thing, right? Is this a stand-up guy? Because I don't know the reference, so I don't well, know who well, it is. Well, Keith is a football announcer. Oh, of, of, that's why I wouldn't one, know, of One course. of the great football announcers of all time. I got so I get a call from... Dave I, loves sports. I'm crazy for sports. He heard me, so I get a call from a guy named Darcy Hedrick, who was one of his producers, and they said, listen... Dave wants you to do the show. I went, oh, my God, because this was the NBC show now, the late night show. Right. I said, well, I would love to. And he goes, but he, he doesn't want you on. He wants your voice <laughs> to do a – to do a uh, – to do a – phone. Impression. Thanks, Darcy. Right, call, call – it was, it was dial a Keith Jackson, you know. If you're feeling – if you're feeling Hang low – Hang on. I just happen to have a phone right, right here. <laughs> right. Well, that's what it was. And, in fact, it is on YouTube. So I, he picked up the phone and went, hello, get a minute, it's Kate Jackson, and whoa, boy, we've got a real barn for the phone. And he was cracking up, and the audience went crazy. Was this the bit where every time you would pick it up, you're the, right, and, oh, right, that's the right. best. And that's it was hysterical. Greatest. And, you know, what I love is, of course, he broke the wall, as we all know, that what Letterman used to do, and he would look at people and, 
he, he would find so many weird things. So anyway, long story short, he has me on the show, and he had me on multiple times. Now, Keith Jackson, the real Keith Jackson, who was a venerable, important sports broadcaster, play-by-play man for football, wasn't sure if I was complimentary or, oh, in, or mocking him. So he didn't like it at first. But then he started seeing that I was doing it as a kind of homage, a kind of a fun thing in the way that Martin Short does Jerry Lewis. There you go. Although Keeping Jerry, him relevant. That's a little darker, too, though Martin Short's Jerry the Lewis. Lozenge. Right, the lozenge. <laughs> anyway, but um, I, I, I'm, don't even get me started, Martin Short. Us, too. That's the Us fun, too. Her funniest, all-time favorite. That's the funniest man alive, in I, my we, opinion. We might agree with you. Yes. She definitely probably yeah, does. Yeah, yeah. And I love Martin Short. So... Anyway, he has me on four different times, and he has me on. I'll give you one quick aside story. I'm terrified the first show because I, this is after he did the Dallas Keith Jack, because it's Dave Letterman, and I'm afraid that I'm going to be overmatched. I'm the sports guy. I had a national sports show, but I was not known as a funny guy. And I've been really nervous. So I go to the green room, and I, I sit down, and, sit, and he sits right next to me, Smokey Robinson. <gasps> and he goes, oh, my God, it's Roy Firestone. Holy smokes. I can't believe no Roy Firestone is here. You know, I'm a big Laker fan, and I have been watching you for so many old men. And I'm sitting, I'm going, it's Smokey Robinson. And I'm sitting, and because I'm having this conversation, I forgot about the time. I forgot about being nervous. <laughs> and then they called me in. I hadn't even a chance to get nervous about the Letterman shot. But do you know the funniest thing is that next time I did the Letterman show, Smokey Robinson was on <laughs> Your again. Your old buddy. It's incredible. It was all, it was, what are the odds of that? And I've seen Smokey a few times, and I do a Smokey impression in the show, in my live well, show. this one was pretty good. I, I, I like to think it was. So uh, fast forward, I, I had laryngitis one time. I had to go to a throat doctor because I do a lot of shows. And I go to a throat doctor in Beverly Hills, and... This is like Z-Lig, like, you know, like a Woody Allen Z-Lig thing where he's everywhere. Smokey walks in. He goes, oh, my God, Roy Firestone. He goes, <laughs> Every time. I can hardly talk. That's why I'm here, too. But would you do me a favor? Would you open for me in Las Vegas oh and just God. do me? Do me for two hours. <laughs> and I thought that was one of the funniest things. It was one of the funniest things that happened in my life. And to this day, and I have lots of shots with me and Smokey, but it's almost eerie how often we run into each other in Let's different see. stages of our lives. So You're going to show us it? I don't know if it's on there, That's but it's, if, you, if you write, oh, I'll send it to you. Okay. These are all pictures you know, of You know what? People. This is great, though. Can we start going through the? Let's I don't want to interrupt it. the story, Let's but since there are Where's some the, here, we'll just throw this oh, up. Oh, there it is. Okay, just oh, we'll I go see right. Barkley, that's okay. one guy I recognize. And that's Hakeem, uh, Hakeem the Dream Olajuwon from okay. Lagos, Nigeria. I've heard of that. So man. I asked a question and I said, gentlemen, you know, Barkley is a very quick witted, one of the most quick witted people in comedy or not in comedy, and sees the sports, obviously, Basketball Hall of Famer. So I said, Olajuwon and Barkley, gentlemen, are you going to heaven? So Olajuwon mm-hmm. goes, well, I believe if my service to God is from Nigeria, if the preparation for all of mankind and my community of God will all, and he's doing this thing, then I believe only then I will go to heaven, wherever heaven may be. And I said, nicely said, Hakeem. I said, how about you, Charles? Are you going to heaven? He goes, I don't know, but it's going to be a close vote. <laughs> Uh, he's so great. He's just so quick with it. And, you know, Charles and I have had this relationship for decades, and I've never found him at a loss for words. And every time he says something, he's, he can say it funny. But he doesn't do it as like, how, how would I say this? How would it? No, he comes it just natural. comes right naturally. Yeah. So let's just go down these different pictures. Right, go to the next it. one. Uh, let's see. Okay. Who's this? I've oh. never seen that guy before in my life. <laughs> well... This Not is, one of the most famous humans walking the planet. You've got to show Jer- the Jerry Maguire one before we get to that because uh, the McCartney comes after Jerry Maguire and Uh-oh. there's a reason for it. You, oh, I you didn't see, realize that. You, that's okay. No, that's Jimmy Stewart. Oh, we'll get goodness. to that. There's McCartney again. Ali. We're going to go through all of them. <laughs> there's, Keith, all. there's Keith Jackson, by the way. Oh, that, really? That's really Keith okay. Jackson. There's Charles, Charles Barkley, again. Elton John. you got to find it. Well, that's, that's Mrs. Amelia. There's Bell. Harry Carey. God, we're going to go through all these stories. That there's Wilt. <laughs> But the bottom is Bill Wall. We'll eventually find it. We'll eventually find it. Oh, those are the ones I, that's all I have. Okay. Is there another one? Well, that's okay. Uh, anyway, well, well, now you can see where we're going, What folks. a cavalcade of stars, though. That's Holy right. smokes, Roy Fire So I do this movie, Jerry Maguire, which is a very famous movie, and I'm very proud to have been it. But I, honest to God, did not expect to be viewed uh, as a sort of iconic figure as an interviewer. They had me on the show. 
in the well, movie. Yeah, I think you're crazy for thinking well, that, but let's hear I, your you story. Know, I, I, so I, I go in there. I, Tom Cruise is the first guy I see. He goes, have you, have you seen Cuba? Now, I thought he meant a country. <laughs> Because <laughs> Cuba Gooding Jr. was not at that point a famous person. Not a one name person. He was not a, a one, he was certainly not Cuba, you know. <laughs> so um, I said, no. And he introduces me, this is Cuba. And I'm going, where in Cuba are you from? And I don't even know what the hell I'm doing. <laughs> like a nickname? He, right. I thought it was his nickname, right? It turns out that was the scene, the famous scene where he gets the money and he gives me a big hug at the end of the movie. He's a famous athlete in this well, movie. Well, you get him to cry. Isn't I get that, him to cry. Yeah, that's the, okay. that's the famous part. So. He grabs me the first time in the first take, and I'm on one of these rolling chairs, and he starts like that, mm-hmm. except I start falling backwards, oh. and I'm almost, I'm almost ready to, you know, he grabbed me so suddenly that the crew had to grab me <laughs> and to save my life, basically. I would have had a concussion or something. <laughs> so, the, the, you know, the famous thing is show me the money, but yeah. it's also don't make me cry, Roy. Mm-hmm. Every restaurant, every library, every airport, every baggage claim, someone says, hey, don't make me cry, right? <laughs> So six months after the movie was filmed, six months later, I am at Liverpool, England, and I'm at a reception, and I get a tap on my shoulder. And now you can show that picture again. Who was it, Roy? (laughs) He goes, I think I know you. And I said, "Uh, you definitely don't know me, Paul, but it's a great honor to meet you. He goes, no, I do know you. I know I've met you. I said, no, you haven't met me. You've never met me. And then a woman who was with him says, he he means the movie. I went, oh, 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 you mean Jerry Maguire? He goes, that's it. He goes, what's your name? And I said, my name is Roy. He goes, don't make me cry, Roy. (gasps) So now this is Paul McCartney. Now, Paul McCartney, like many of us, is my idol. I mean, I idolize the guy. I'm sitting here stunned. But not only does it, it doesn't end there. He's going, you just stay where you are. I'm going to bring the funniest guys you've ever met from Liverpool that are going to talk to you because you've got to, you've got to meet Jimmy McGurney. Now, these are, oh. to, these are total... <laughs> stra- Who's with me? Jimmy to- McGurney. To- to- total strangers, <laughs> total uh, stra- strange random people he knew that he thought were funny growing up. <laughs> this is the funniest guy I've ever known. This is the guy that makes him cry. <laughs> now, I'm sitting... Now, I'm, I'm like, I'm blown away by this because this is all happening at 2 o'clock in the morning. And I feel like this is a hallucination or, or a dream. Or, but it really happened. Once again, Paul McCartney, Paul folks. McCartney, Paul dude. McCartney. But I, similar thing happened, but not quite. Uh, something in the same sphere with Elton John. I know you have an Elton mm-hmm. John picture. Mm-hmm. So let's just put, there it is. I'm doing a, a, a fundraiser for Andre Agassi, the tennis player. And Elton John is, is the headliner. And we're in the green room, and he goes... I've got to be your, do your show. I went, well, yes, Elton, I, I'm, I'm you know, not going to turn Elton John down. No. I said, I think that I could find room for you maybe on the show. <laughs> he goes, the schedule. but you know what I've wanted to talk about? I said, what? He goes, the Atlanta Braves. I went, the Atlanta Braves? What the? He is a major baseball fan. And he lives in Atlanta, <laughs> which you may not know he lives in Atlanta. <laughs> And he has, uh, I'll show that picture again if, he, if you can. There it is. He, so he comes up to me, he goes, I only want to talk Braves. And I said, what? We did 20 minutes, about 18 of which he talked about the Atlanta Braves lineup <laughs> and why they need to have this guy here and that guy. I said, Elton, this is wild. He goes, well, you know, when I was growing up in rock and roll, I would stay in my home because there's nowhere to go. I'm not going to go to a mall or something. So I sit and I watch two things, soap opera and baseball. And I became addicted. He's a very addictive personality, mm-hmm. both good and bad. Sure. But when he makes up his mind, he loves something, he just stays with it. And he's a massive tennis fan. He, wow. He, he was talking about all these sports. And I'm just blown away by all of this experience. But Elton, and he's in the book too. But Elton John gave me 25 minutes of intense baseball knowledge. Same thing with Richard Nixon. I had Richard Nixon on the show. I don't think I don't have a one. picture of that. I, I, Boy, that'd be great. Yeah, well, I have, but I did do a bunch of things. Nixon, you know, I interviewed him and he wanted to talk baseball. And, you know, he had that voice and he talked like that. I, I saw the show and, and, and he's telling me all these things. It's Richard Nixon. And I hated Nixon as a kid. You know, I really <laughs> did. But I'm getting along with him. Because Nixon is sort of baseball fan, and we're making making inside little jokes and references. Finally, he goes, "You know, I saw the show you had your dad on. I always enjoyed that show." Now, remember, I hate Nixon, but for a second there, he's saying something really sweet. And about so, you personally, and your personally, family. and he had seen the show. Mm-hmm. 
my father hated Nixon. <laughs> he, hated, he really did. So I called my father and I said, Dad, you're not going to believe where I am. He goes, what? I said, I'm with interviewing Richard Nixon. He goes, that son of a bitch. Let me tell you, that guy belongs in prison. That I said, Dad, wait. He just said he saw the show with you on. He thought you were terrific and he really enjoyed the show. My father goes, well, you know, my father goes, well, you know, he did a lot of great things for China. He did a lot of great things for women's rights and the environment. He's a very, very important figure in the 20th century. Immediately. That's my all father it takes. Changed, all it Full took. forgiveness. It all, it Full all pardon. Did. Full yeah. pardon. So why don't you scroll through some of these? So I'll tell you the stories if you like. If sure. You do it that way. Let's see. Who, I see well, Jimmy Stewart on the there, left. There's Jimmy, Jimmy Stewart. <laughs> I, I, now, you have to understand the, the, what a thrill it was to meet Jimmy Stewart. Too, but, but because, not just because he was an icon, but here's the story. You that, are so, Roy, I have to interrupt you just to say that, do you know what, I mean, you obviously do this on purpose, but you are an excellent mimic. Thank you. Thank you. I thought you were well, getting to Lake Bo- <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. No, no, that's okay. It's a genuine we, pain in the ass. I got to tell, <laughs> tell you something. My block, I live in Encino, California, but my block is actually, in the 1946, was a scene in the movie, It's a Wonderful Life. Yes, and so is the Balboa Golf Course, which you may or may not know, over in Encino. That what was, was it the, Bedford Falls? Bedford, Bed, Bed, Bedford? But Bedford Falls. So I did a piece, and it's on YouTube. I can't run the whole piece, but I did an essay. What would have been, I mean, not an essay, but an actual re, re, a rethink. Mm-hmm. What would have been like if uh, George Bailey uh, from It's a Wonderful Life, as Jimmy Stewart, went back to Bedford Falls now, today? Oh, so, so it starts off like, I went down the block. To the five and dime store and someone out in front said they don't exist anymore <laughs> so i went a bit further to look for some place at sears and somebody said there wasn't one there for years so it was a piece God, about how so life has changed and how you can't go to a camera you can't get a film you try to get film for your camera and you know or an encyclopedia britannica you know everything's gone from what he knew in 1946 it's almost a twilight zone episode this is excellent but again i have to pause you because i don't think other people realize how good what you're doing is you're not just doing jimmy stewart you're doing jimmy stewart <laughs> and jimmy stewart's work jimmy stewart used to be a poet and a, yes. and, a, and he would do these wonderful readings on the tonight show with johnny carson can i tell you what and what, you're doing it because your you. rhymes and i believe me i'm getting and, what you're putting and out I, and i appreciate that I, if there's one piece that I'm proud of, and certainly we can't we can't really run it for a bunch of reasons. But if you, it is on YouTube, and I want anyone. Who's oh, if watching, it's already on YouTube, I'll link it in, okay. the, in the description. Okay, I do a piece where Jimmy Stewart, which is really me, my voice, goes back on the Tonight Show, and he talks about all high tech digital e- digital editing. So it's like kind of the other know, side of the Bedford Falls one. It, it, like it is. It's a similar thing, but he does stuff like my my download wouldn't upload. <laughs> <laughs> and my flash, my my flash drive was in crash mode, you know, and and so people write on YouTube. How did Jimmy Stewart know? About oh my God! So to it's me, that, good. that is the greatest compliment of all because it's on there, and it looks like Johnny Carson is laughing, and responding to it, like we came on to do one of his poems. Yeah, and it's called Technical Difficulties. It's Roy Firestone called Technical Difficulties. I like to think. It's among my favorite things that I've ever done in my life. Oh, wow. And what makes it really remarkable is it's real. It looks real. People think Jimmy Stewart somehow knew about <laughs> flash drives and crash modes and Wikipedia and you know, Yammer and Yelp and yeah. all this crap, you know. And it's done in a poem, and Johnny's reacting to it. So that, to me, there's only one other piece, and we'll talk about that, too, is my Beatles piece, where I actually become... Paul McCartney through CGI effects. So, and they do that in my live show too. Wow. So I like to feel- Are a lot of these impressions in the live show, I hope? Yes, okay. yes. I do about, I guess, 15 or 18 impressions. I, I do Casey Kasem counting them down. And I, <laughs> and look now? at me. I do a lot of Johnny Mathis oh, and I do, God. Tony Bennett, hey. Hey, everybody. <laughs> I'm so happy. Is, is he not the happiest guy you've ever- He is, hey, and I've met him many, I, many times. I can't believe what I'm doing. I'm talking to all these great young people. It How is, about that? How about that? You know, and, uh, and then I had I have Gordon Lightfoot, which no one does. I no. have. I have do you Bob do his Skag. speaking voice or his music? No, he's, Bob, Gordon Lightfoot is a speaking <laughs> voice. Wouldn't sell back. a lot of oh tickets. But the thing about it is, I always had this theory about Gordon Lightfoot. 
Somewhere in his lyrics, it's remember the days. Remember the days. I the <laughs> you know, it's always like remember the day. I remember the days. It's always remember the days. I don't know what it is about Gordon. Now, I know I'm dating myself because no one knows who the hell Gordon You've Lightfoot. got an audience of one over here, right. maybe two. <laughs> remember the days when I'm feeling. That's uh, the anyhow. only line I know of that. My parents uh, had that sundown, record. <laughs> that's all that. But, but uh, you know, I, I had heard, now I have never met Gordon Lightfoot, but a lot of these stories, I'm telling you, the people have finally crossed paths with me. Yeah. It's, I hear you do. So the, one of the things that's really one of the coolest things, if I heard Gordon Lightfoot love the impression. I had never met him. But what did happen was Johnny Mathis came on the show because he was a real athlete. On your show? On my show. He was a, a long jumper and he ha- could have gone what? to the Olympics. Yes, he could have gone to the Olympics. I did not and know that. He decided to go to Capitol Records and get the deal, which ended up being okay for him. <laughs> but he says, I understand that you do an impression of me and it's really good. I went, look at me. I'm as helpless as. And he's going crazy. It's not just the voice. You make your face look like his, and his is a completely different but he, shape. But he's going crazy. And I said, he says, you know, and he's a great guy. Johnny Mathis is one. He's like 83 now. He's been everything. Yeah. He's hit records. Been around forever. He says, you know, I've really enjoyed your impression. He says, but all the years, all these people done, yours is the best I ever heard. I went, oh, God. Mm. So all of this experience was good. And then I, you know, I would have loved to have met John Lennon because John Lennon, I think, would have been a challenge to get him to laugh at himself. <laughs> but I would have liked that challenge because <clears throat> the thing about Lennon, you know, I do all four Beatles. Uh, let me just give you the four run, the okay. four run. Paul is really upbeat. You know, he's always happy. It's great, you know. We really started back then. Really the beginning of Liverpool. And then we went Hamburg. It was great. And John is more like that. He's more bitter and angry. It's all rubbish and crap. It's all we ever did was rubbish, you know. It's all oh, everything Paul wants did, you know. And that's that. Still got and, an axe to grind. And George is really kind and relaxed <laughs> and thinking really about what happens with Maharishi and perhaps that, yes, too. And Ringo's more like that, you know. He doesn't really know and he's glad to be here. But peace and love, Thank peace you. and love. So I did a piece, and I think we're going to show, maybe we can show stills of it at mm-hmm. some point, because I can't run the clip because of clearance. But what would happen if I replaced Paul McCartney <gasps> in the Twilight Zone? You're imagining Mr. Mr. Roy Firestone, you know, the, Rod, wow. the whole Rod Serling. Yeah. Thing. So I have Rod Serling, and we did it with the CGI effect. And I have all four Beatles talking about me as member of the Beatle. And Paul going, you know, the thing is about Roy, he was really much better as a Beatle than I was a sportscaster, you know, <laughs> that kind of a thing. And I do all my loving on the Sullivan Show with the Beatles. Oh, my it's, goodness It's a CGI gracious. effect. It's on, it's on, on YouTube. Uh, Did you get that idea, though, after your uh, yes. interaction with yes. Paul? My whole existence, I grew up in Miami Beach, Florida, where the Beatles came the second week in America. That was the same week they fought. Oh, they went from New York to Miami? Right. No shot. Second week they fought uh, when Cassius Clay fought Sonny Liston, the famous Muhammad Ali picture with the Beatles. You everyone seen it. The famous was, knockout picture, right? That was, yes. That was about three blocks from my house growing wow. up. Wow. So I was nine years old, eight years old, and I'm dreaming someday I'm going to know these guys. And I got mm-hmm. to know Ali really well. You can give me that Ali story Yes, there. absolutely. We have the, the uh, Ali. Where is, where, is where is it? There it is. There it is. There it is. I mean, I'm so fast and so pretty. I'm the greatest of all time. And then I do a thing where Howard goes Fellow so, MS guy, too. Right. right. That's right. Well, no, we had Parkinson's. Oh, yeah. But, Parkinson's. but they're related. I'm sorry. They're right. related. Yeah, you're right. But. I did a thing where Howard Cosell, who was another venerable before your time, I guess. No, there's a there's a wide world of sports hats sitting right oh, behind you. Right. I love it. <laughs> but Howard Cosell was like this, and every time he was very belligerent to people who wanted to talk. So I said, to, and I knew Cosell. I said, what would it be like to have Howard Cosell and Muhammad Ali as rappers, as a hip-hop group? So I, I will give you a 30-second dissertation of what that's on this. And we, Luckily, we, Roy Firestone has done the work for us on this, folks. Yeah. Let's check it out. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I'm Howard Cosell. Without further ado, there's the opening bell. We're here today to view and observe a three-time champ with a hell of a nerve. He fought all comers with speed and savvy, though, in later years. He got rather flabby. Now, Howard Cosell, I hear what you say. You're full of hot air. You got a bad toupee. I fought with style. I fought with class. And you ain't nothing but a pain in my ass. There it is. That's that's Cosell and Ali. Oh my goodness. She is the greatest audience. I, yes. Of, 
I'm taking you on the road. Wow, what a, everything I'm doing, she's loving it. She just, means it too. I know she does. It's lovely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, You're good. Uh, that's amazing. That's so amazing. You can scroll some other ones. What do we got here? Well, gosh, all right. I mean, we can this keep going so if you cool. want. I have some questions for you too. Well, at some you point. can throw. <laughs> just throw one and then do a question. Throw one and do another question. There we go. Uh, who's uh, this here? Harris Will. Oh, Will, Will Ch- Chamberlain. Will Chamberlain. <laughs> First time I met him. Come out of a restaurant in Santa Monica, California. Three hundred thousand dollar white Rolls, convert- Rolls Royce convertible. To- dogs in the back seat with the top down, <laughs> as big as small horses. I mean, huge. Dalmatian Great Danes, these gigantic dogs. And I walk around on the, the, the driver's side, and there's Will Chamberlain. He's got, well, this is a later shot but that oh, you're showing, but same. that's okay, you can show it. Again, uh, is that it there? No, I, yeah, there it is. There, yeah, look at the size of this dude. Okay, he's 7'3". 7'3". 7'2 and a half, three, 333 and 40 pounds. Mm, he's wearing huge. a silver and purple jumpsuit. He's got a burgundy <laughs> beret. He's got a lemon lined <laughs> feather coming out. So I walk up to him, and I mean, it's Will Chamberlain. I said, my God, Will, look at these dogs. Look at this car. Look at this clothes that you're wearing. Would you come on my show? He goes, Roy, I'd like to come on, but right now I'm trying to keep a low profile. Ah! <laughs> real, low, real low profile he had. Wow. Uh, we, we just had, and he, he did the show numerous times, and I'm just, just so tickled to have had that legend. And he was a larger-than-life character. He would drive across country on a whim on, on like really? a 10 minutes notice he go he he would water ski barefoot at Did people know that about him? I yeah, thought he, he was, was famous a, for like the you know the the ladies. The women. Well yeah. he was that's before me From too. His book. Remember the book we Before me he too he, he felt he was the all-time leading scorer if you know what hey-o! I mean. Hey. <laughs> Old school hey. 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 But uh, I, I, I really feel like that was one of the people who – he was one of the people that really changed the dynamic of the show because he came on and he brought so much aura. Now, the funny mm. thing is I said, what do you think is – he wanted to say aura. I said, what do you think it is about you that's so attractive to the public? And he goes, I think it's my uh, 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 aroma. I went, <laughs> Not quite the same thing as an aura, but uh, <laughs> wilt. <laughs> but uh, yes, you want to hit me with a question, then we'll do another picture. Well, what I, the one question I had more than anything else when you were coming here is you were famous for an interview style that was um, more like what we do, and it's not. It, we're not trying to imitate you. It's I don't know how to have a an interview interview like a Larry King and just right. go down the questions. Right. I like to have a conversation form. with people. I like to form. see where it goes. I have some ideas in my head of where it could go, but really it comes I down love, to where I the magic the is. Like what we're doing now yes. is I love the storytelling. I love people telling stories. I love people when they came on the show. I use the phrase, come to play, if mm-hmm. you know what I mean. Sometimes you get people who are on a promotional tour and they're, mm-hmm. not, they're not thrilled about doing anything and they, they feel obligated. Or they've got their bullets and that's all they want to yeah, hit. I, I like it when people want to want to share and want to be fun and funny or touching or and you know i got a reputation as the guy quote makes him cry but we didn't have that many people who really cried I, only only 20, that was more from the few, movie yeah. was 20, that more? 25 out of 5,000 yeah. cried but but <laughs> I love but that there's on staff people remember it. that people remember the tears you know but do they remember it from the show or do they remember it because it's been immortalized by jerry Maguire? well that's, and that's a, why that, i was you know asking. that's an interesting question i think i think it could be a little of both i mean obviously they remember the show but jerry Maguire really amplified it as i said it was whatever that movie whatever, was huge when whatever it 25 out of 5,000 is it's point zero 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 <laughs> but when you had Dennis Rodman cry, that's what started the Jerry Maguire thing because the director, Cameron Crowe, saw De- 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 Dennis Rodman on my show crying. He says, we need to get Dennis Rodman to play Rod Tidwell, the, uh, Jerry, the show me sure. the money guy, and have Roy Firestone be the interviewer. But the truth is, he t- Rodman was asked to do it and turned them down. Yeah, How be- crazy is that? that. Well, Nuts. That. Yeah. Back then, he was the biggest thing going. Right, but still, it's a, he could have made his change his life. He could have won the Academy Award if he was decent, and he was he had been in a movie before. Um, Space Jam. No, he was in he was in a movie with uh, with uh, what's his name? The uh, oh wait, Mark, he did a an John action Claude movie. Van Damme. Yes, I yes. forgot about that. It was called Double Team. There you go. And I had to interview oh, him about wow. it. You know, he started thinking he was a major actor. You know, <laughs> he's going to be you a say s- that it was uh, method acting. No, no, rock star too, I think. For yeah, he had a little of everything, but. Um, you know, all I could say is I love it when people came to play. When they came up, when they, they brought their A game on a show and wanted to share stories, funny, touching, inspiring, whatever it might be. So, would you like it more when people came with prepared stories that, oh, I want to tell these four or well, five? Or I would didn't you like it better they were when they were if, open to, to long, Roy Firestone? Well, that's a good point. As long as they were 
uh, authentic. Yes. It, was, it wasn't like they, you know, a lot of these stories I'm telling today I've told before, but it's authentic in the moment because it's real and it's, you know, I'm, t I'm trying to think of all the details of what happened that day. Yeah. You asked some very interesting questions and, the, and talking about Dave Letterman and all those things. But I, I liked it when it was, it felt kind of kinetic and original and fresh, yeah. but but they still told their stories. You know, the one of my favorite stories, and I've told this many times in my one man show, is about Muhammad Ali again. And uh, went to a nursing home in South. It's a little touching, but it's funny. And okay. then, then that's it's the best type. And then it's touching again. So I'll tell you what happens. So we go to this nursing home, and we're in South Beach, Florida. And these are elderly people. And Ali goes in this room, and I'm so great, I'm fast. Everybody, tell my, you know, he's doing that thing. And these people are having no idea who the hell this guy is. Oh you know? my goodness, they're that's like, a shame. They're like well into their nineties. He goes in another room, and he goes, I'm. What is my name, old man? And the old man who was in a wheelchair, who who didn't see speak. Or or see really well had no response mm -hmm. so Ali says it again come on tell everybody what is my name and nothing so Ali starts walking away as he's walking away I see this incredible thing happen I see this old man in this chair 97 like a light bulb went off in his head he turns it and he speaks and he goes I know who you are and Ali goes back you know who I am he goes that's right I know who you are I'm 98 years old, I'll never forget. You're the champ of the world. You're the greatest of all time. I love you because my dream come true and I got to meet the champ. Now everyone's crying now. I'm about really to, right, champ. right? Yes. Wait a minute, so here's the thing. <laughs> he goes back, he goes, you right old man, I'm the greatest of all time. And now he tell everybody and everybody in this room, what is my name? And the old man looks up and he goes, Joe Lewis. <laughs> But now here's where it gets touching. Here's where it gets great. I don't even know anything about sports, but I remember that battle. <laughs> here's what here's what I love. Ali his his entourage starts to correct the old man. Hey old man, that ain't no Joe that no Joe Lewis and Ali starts because Yeah, he goes, How dare you correct that old man? What's wrong with you? Come over here and I go listen to this with an earshot and he says, Listen, I have been the greatest, I've been the champ, and the champ should do things to make people feel good. And if in his whole life, all the champ that he ever believed in, that he dreamed to meet, was Joe Lewis, then guess what? His dream came true, because tonight, tonight, my name is Joe Lewis. Now, it's that, beautiful. That's like, I right. want to applaud, yeah. And then I thought about it, and this is where I tell this in my show. I think Muhammad Ali had a quality as, as a champion to uplift other people, to mm -hmm. make people feel important or special, or just love who they are, or love their culture, or love their, their creed, or love their, their color. And that is what made Ali great. And then I thought about this famous quote from George Washington Carver, who was a philanthropist and a botanist back in the late 30s, 40s, 50s. And he said, how far you all go in your life depends upon your ability to be tender with the young and compassionate with the aged and tolerant of the weak and the strong and those who strive because someday in your life you'll have been every one of those things yourself. Wow. And then I thought that's what Ali was. He was he was weak, he was strong, he, he was patient, he was impatient, but in the, in the overall genesis of life he was all of those things. That to me is why he was the greatest champion of all, because he knew how to make people feel better about their condition. That's remarkable. Yeah, there's, a, there's that's a humanity to it. But there's a story <laughs> in the, my show, and that's one of the things I do in this show almost all the time. And I get more reaction from that than almost any story. Let's talk about your show for a second. Sure. You, you're doing the show all around. How how often is it? Where is it? Is it a tour, or does it, it just depends. kind of pop up? It depends. I just got I did four shows on the Holland America Cruise Lines, and I did oh. four four nights there, which was really cool. Um, I did the Beatles piece, which was really well received. Is it a is it all performance, or is it an AV show as it's well? Very, it's very it's very clip oriented, okay. but it's it's an all it's an all encompassing show. And I sing, I do a lot of musical impressions, and in my own voice, I do a tribute to Glenn Campbell, who was oh, I idolized him. Glenn Campbell, yeah. yeah, I I loved so many of the th you know most of the things that I do, even in the impressions or people. Do you do Glenn Campbell? No, but I. Hi, do. I'm Glenn Campbell. No, but I, I t <laughs> I'll tell you what's in. I'll give you a thirty second story. In 1961, as a young kid, he's probably 14 at the time, 13 at the time, he's driving a tractor in a place called Laverna, Oklahoma. And he's driving this tractor, 
and he's got a transistor radio. And on the, on the transistor radio comes a song called Turn Around, Look at Me. And he didn't quite catch the whole name of the person who sang the song, but he loved the song. Okay. So he was so excited. He was so distracted, he drove the tractor into a ditch for a second, right? So then he said, I gotta find out who this guy who sang this song was, because I wanna write a song with him someday, because I'd like to be a songwriter. He's like 13 years old. Yeah, you couldn't back up 30 seconds okay. on the transistor radio and like you can today. It, it, yeah, that's right, there was no, there was no <laughs> internet in those right. days in 61. No. And there's like 1,500 people live in this town. And his pa parents are very strict and they're very religious. But he says, I just heard something today that changed my life, and I gotta meet whoever this Campbell guy is. He was Campbell. The guy says, Campbell, I don't know anyone named Campbell. Turned out it was Glenn Campbell. But six years later, at 19 years old, Jimmy Webb, who was on that tractor, that was the kid, Jimmy Webb, wrote, by the time I get to Phoenix, Wichita Lineman, Galveston, Up, Up, and all of these songs. And he didn't Inspiration. even... Inspiration. You talk about thrilling story. And... He didn't even meet Glenn Campbell till the night of the Grammys for By the Time I Get to Phoenix, and they won that <laughs> oh night, that night. So That's amazing. I tell that That's story. That's one of those universal stories yes, that are and so I told good. Yes, and I tell that story because I love surprise endings because we don't tell you at the payoff that it was Jimmy Webb. Right. But Jimmy Webb, one of the great songwriters of all time, and he did Wichita Lyman, which to me I think is almost – Cinematic and it's almost theatrical. I, I believe it's one of the great pop songs in the history of pop music, and I do it in the show. You call Jimmy Webb one of the greatest songwriters. I consider Neil Diamond one of the greatest American songwriters, <laughs> and you do a little Neil Diamond. Do we have any sound that we could, we could play? <laughs> you mean the America clip? I don't think we have that loaded up. Well, I, I, I'll tell you what I'll do is I'll try to do this without music, but it's <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, let me see. Uh, let's see. Hey, come to America. I find my way. Mo <laughs> you know, he, he did that song, song, blue. Oh, everybody that's... knows one. Song, song, blue. Everybody shows one. And songbird, sing oh. your song. You know, all that kind. But the thing about Neil Diamond was, Neil Diamond was always, <laughs> Neil Diamond was always that, almost talking his way through it. Yeah. Right? Like, um, Spoken word, man. You know, like, Cracklin' Rosie, get on board. It's almost like that when you sing a song. And, and so I do that in the show, and I have, here comes, he comes to America. Of he course. come to America. You know. But, you know, sadly, Neil is no longer doing not it either. Not performing, yeah. Right, but you don't know this about me, but I'm not a concert guy. I'm not a sports guy, believe it or not. Right, right. Forrest, <laughs> Forrest, 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 Forrest. But my first concert ever was Neil Diamond yeah. in the round at wow. Hartford Civic Center, wow. where the Whalers used to play. Well, I got to tell you, and it was a blast. I remember every second of it. I was thinking about, uh, you are the sun and I am the moon. Mm -hmm. You are the words, I am the tune. <laughs> Lay, me. Lay me. But you know, that, <laughs> that style is sort of gone. But I It is gone. It, everything, everybody's trying too hard. The, the, he was loafing through it and it right. worked. It did. And he was a storyteller and he wrote great yes. songs. And he wrote I'm a Believer and he wrote For the Monkeys. And the Jonathan Livingston Seagull soundtrack. He did, he did uh, so many great, great, great records. But... I, I, I got to meet Neil one time, but you know, I, I it thought it was too imposing for me to mention. You don't want to do an impression of you. Know, oh my goodness! Did but, he know who you were? Oh yeah, he because oh, he well, knew the sports. I'm, he liked the sports. He used to go to Laker games and stuff. I used to he see. He probably would have liked it, Roy. Yeah, uh, maybe. Well, Johnny <laughs> Mathis did. So. <laughs> what kind of kid were you, growing up in Miami? I was a kid who was always dreaming. I was, yeah. uh, I was a kid who, as I said, I wanted when I saw the Ali and. Beatles, I mm -hmm. wanted to meet all of them, yep. and I met some of them, and I met, of course, Ali and Clay when he was Clay, but, yep. I, you know, I probably did 20 things with him. But, but were, were, did but you do your it, schoolwork? Were you a good I kid? Was a, I was a goofy kid. Yeah, I was, I was and a shy kid, and I was also a guy who wanted to be around sports because I love sports, but I couldn't play it, so I talked my way into being Uncoordination? Uh, un uncoordinated or what? a little of everything. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm bad gonna, body. <laughs> I had, I had a little. I went to band, so that's right. why I'm asking. What did you play? Drums and piano. Oh, cool. But I, it, it, I always wanted to experience what it would be like to be in a locker room. So sure enough, I talked my mom, who I, I couldn't even drive in. I was like 14, 15, to take me to the Orioles training camp in Miami, the Baltimore Orioles team. Wow. That, this hat I'm wearing is an Oriole, mm -hmm. you can see. Uh, 
And I, one one thing led to another. I end up being the Bat Boy for the Orioles, and I started what? doing. What? Yeah, at I, the old Camden Yards. Well, no, the, well, well before Camden Yards, it was Miami where they trained. Oh, that, you're right. You said that. where I'm they sorry. trained. I'm That's sorry. okay. And uh, I used to perform my little show for the ball players. Now to this day, some of the players who are still alive, some in their 80s now, said, All right, "I know you first as not the sports guy, not as the <gasps> humor. I know you as our Bat Boy." I mean, he, right. they remembered the Bat Boy era, but I would do like a little one-man show even then well how five many minutes. bat boys were out there entertaining the players really? well i think the other the, there were a couple of the bat boys just said, look at this showboat look at this guy let's get him let's get him out of it they probably hated my guts to tell you the truth but that's how it really started so in answer to your question i was a kid who had dreams but i always wanted to be around a microphone like this mm. i loved something where i could move people connect with people inspire people make them laugh but where and did that of come course, from that's what I don't understand. I Why it, are you so I think, in tune to I that think stuff? A, I think a lot of people in life need to feel like they mattered in some capacity. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, if you're selling shoes, it's dried right. It's not as easy to connect with people to where it's, you know. And not as what, meaningful, the connection. But if you can tell stories and you can do some voices and you can make people laugh and make people think like we do with Muhammad Ali's story. Even as a kid, I said, I would like to do that. But I was scared of becoming, you know, uh, only a stand-up. I didn't uh, want to. I did some. Stand-up. Is that why you didn't go that path? I did because not you go clearly that path. could. I wanted to go to the back door, which I did through sports, and I became. That's how I got. I mean, if I had just been a stand-up, I probably would have never seen the light of day, of Letterman. But he he saw that's me how I and felt he knows me as, as a sportscaster who did funny voices. So he sort of got already a built-in whatever celebrity. So that's why he had me out. But I would have never been on Letterman without having been a sportscaster. It's so interesting to yeah. me. Yeah, so I, I kind of wanted to go. And you know, it's also cost me in some respects too because a lot of stand-ups who I knew, and I I did stand-up at the improv for a bunch of years. People like Richard Lewis and Jerry Seinfeld were there. And, uh, See, that's so, what I was going to say. The stand-up days, Richard Chasler, we were just talking about that as well. I, what year, What when are we talking about? In the about? 80s and 90s. Okay. And you know, people like Carol Liefer who wrote She's for Seinfeld. She's been here, we love yes, Carol Liefer. Carol's great. Love Carol And uh, uh, Paul Reiser and all these great people. And I had to follow them. And I think, and they were probably right, deep down they were saying, you know, this guy's cashing off on being a sportscaster. He's not willing to, to, to make the sacrifice. And they, they weren't wrong. Right. But I I don't did, find anything wrong with that, though. Well, but I did learn, though, that you better get up there. And you don't just get up there and riff. You better have some material and work it. One thing about Jerry, I tell you the thing about Seinfeld. He is such a craftsman. And I admire people who are, work at their craft. He'll go on work on a joke or a, a bit you know, till he gets the exact phrase mm-hmm. that he wants and sees how it goes. Like the, the story I did with Nixon about it, my father is a sure. true story, but it took me months, even really years, from saying, hey, people don't really want to hear that. Then I realized that people relate to the fact that there's a commonality to it, mm. that my father would have said the same thing if yeah. Nixon said that he saw his, whatever. So I worked on that bit for a long time, and I have another bit about Mike Tyson too, similar kind of bit. And I realized that Jerry Seinfeld to me, is a magnificent craftsman. Mm-hmm. And if, if he was working at a, as a watchmaker or if he was making leather goods, he would be the same craftsman. And that's why he's the greatest of the great, in my opinion. Do you, would you consider, is it perfection? Is he a perfectionist? He's a definite perfectionist, but he's got, you know, theme papers, long material. He's got books, and you, you saw the documentary perhaps on HBO about Jerry where he would just, he's got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of pages of material that he's all cross-indexed, and he still has it. And he can tell you a, a joke from 1988 mm. and a joke from 2008 and how it, how it changed. Some jokes he has to throw out because times have changed and yeah. references change. But I admire... And you could see it, and he loves it. He eats, drinks, and sleeps stand-up. Yeah. That's his life. And when you see the coffee, comedians in cars, you can see his love and his admiration for people who do it right. But he, I didn't He think has of, a respect, for sure. I don't think, the... frankly, that I have earned the respect of stand-up people because they know me as a sports guy who's kind of funny. But I'm not a true stand-up in, in that respect. But I don't. Do you want? You don't want to be. I mean, I no, think you're I didn't perfect. want to be. But I understand why their 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 view of it is. Yeah. You know, they work their butt off all the time. And, you know, the comedy pit in Spokane. You know, wherever the wherever the, the hell ha ha hut. The ha ha hut. You know, uh, but and I I admire, but I didn't want to do that. I just for some reason didn't want to be a gypsy. I didn't want to be a comedy gypsy. I think that for some reason is good enough for me. What about writing? You write as well. I write a lot. You write. have a few books, but you've got a new one coming right. out. Do we have a copy of the book? We have a picture of it. 
Oh, oh look at this. We have the actual book. There it is. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Here we go. That's what I'm talking about by Roy Firestone. Yeah. There it is. Could right we see here. that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. There it is. And they can get it on Amazon, and they could get it on RoyFirestone.com. If you want me to sign it, of course, I will. But also for people out there who want me to sign it. Oh, too. I thought you meant me. No, you would. I'll sign it for you too. But uh, if we can keep this, I'd absolutely. like you to sign it. If, if you're going to uh, take uh, it with you, then no, no, it's yours. It's yours. <laughs> but but I uh, I will. If you go to RoyFirestone.com, I sign. But you can't do it on Amazon. If you want to just buy the book and have it, go to Amazon. If you want. To have me personalized, sign it. it goes go to, to Roy Firestone just under That's books. Cool. Just click Actually, page. this is a great time to do a segment we call Billboard. <laughs> all right, this is, is where we can talk about all the plugs and everything. Oh, social, great. Are you on social media? Are I you am. That I'm only. I got off Twitter because I think it's a cesspool. So I got, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I, right. I, I'm very vibrant in fa Facebook at Roy Allen Firestone, ah. and I am doing shows and I promote stuff and I show my bits on Facebook, and I'm very political, but I'm not going to talk politics today. <laughs> and, we appreciate that. Yes, and, but I, I, I love it. I, I, be, the reason I love Facebook as opposed to like Instagram, and the, I like to write, and so I write long pieces. I did an essay today um, or the other day about uh, Halloween. I did something about what, you know, why Halloween is so weird. And, but I, I, I write about everything, pop culture, I do a lot of politics on my page only. Mm -hmm. I do uh, some sports, but I do a lot of storytelling. And ironically, this book, now available on Amazon, <laughs> there it is, is uh, is a is the outgrowth of all my Facebook writings. So oh, I have kidding. essays about Mr. Rogers about. on there, and <gasps> Elton John on there, and uh, you know Bill Walton's story about how he almost committed suicide, and people like Bob Costas and. But a ton of musical <laughs> from people. suicide to Bob Costas. Right, right. Uh, is there anything you can tell us about Mr. Rogers? Do you have any kind of well, connection I, there? Well, I tell you what I did do. He's a I, massive all, fan. I am too. And uh, there's a movie coming out later this month, as you know, Tom Hanks, and it's going to get the Academy nomination. Mm -hmm. He deserves it. Um, have you seen it? I have not, but I've seen, I know enough about it. Yeah. Same so way. I became friendly with a guy named Francois Clemens. No yeah. way. Yes, and Francois Clemens. Do you know is who Francois Clemens Officer is? Cle Officer Clemens, Clemens from the show. African American no guy, way. And famous for the the, the foot uh, the bathing. Foot, the, exactly scene, right, yeah. the bathing in the water. It's a very famous story. So I became friends, and we did an interview. And there's a piece in this book about how he evolved as a human being through Fred Rogers, yes. and Fred Rogers evolved through him because he was African American gay, yep. and was at, wanted to be out at, in 1968, which is not something he did. Right. And he talks about how he, his life changed with Fred's acceptance, respect, mm. and it, it's a very powerful piece. I've done other, there's other pieces in there, Billy Crystal talking about Robin Williams is in this book, oh. and also Muhammad Ali, uh, r comedian Robert Klein, who is one of the oh, all time. I can stop my leg. Right, right. Uh, Robert Love Klein him. is my true hero, is the first guy I really first believe that's why I want to be a stand-up. Because you had seen him, you saw what he was doing, and I because so he wasn't doing normal stand up. So it's, <laughs> what's so weird was uh, I was in college and I loved Robert Klein, and there was a, a opportunity to be an MC at a comedy club, just an MC, not yeah. really perform. You just and now, ladies and gentlemen, you've seen him on the crowd work, yeah, the same announcements. Show, you know? <laughs> so uh, Robert Klein is there, and I'm thrilled, and I introduce Klein, and then after the show. We, we go back with a bunch of students, and he's holding court with a little bit of fumar, if you know what I mean, <laughs> I from, the, from the era. And uh, so flash forward my senior year. Now I was 18 in the beginning, but now it's my senior year. And I get a frantic call from the student entertainment director uh, at University of Miami, where I'm from. They are saying, Robert Klein's our comedian tonight. I, know, I said, I know, I can't wait. He's going, no, no, there was an opening act named Shy Coltrane. She's a singer, and she, she missed her plane, and we need somebody to fill 35 minutes. Now, I have no material, but I get up there, and I wing it for 30, and I'm dying and also scoring and dying and scoring. Absolutely. And That's then, all you can do. And then, uh, then I bring on, you know, the maestro, bring, bring, bring in Robert Klein. So I did this interview. I said, you know, I know you couldn't remember this. He remembered it from really? 1973. Wow. He says, you were the kid who had to fill for like a half hour. I said, yeah. He goes, I remember that. Holy smokes. And yeah, so that was cool. And we talk about how comedy has evolved. And but did how... that, was that a moment for you? Oh, I mean, massive. To, I can't me, even imagine. I remember the student entertainment committee gave me 100 bucks. Now, I have to understand, 100 bucks in 72 and 3 when I was just a kid. 
I took everyone out to dinner. It was like, I was so thrilled. But also, but, who cared? You just opened for Robert Klein. But Robert, it, well, it's technically I did, yeah. And Robert, the irony is he ended 35 up- 35 minutes is opening for Robert <laughs> Klein, sorry. He yeah. ended up coming on my show many times, and so did George Carlin, and so did Jerry, oh, and so did Rickles, and so did all these oh, great man. giants of, com- of comedy. And I had a vehicle where they wanted to come on my show. And I have to tell you, to sit there and have these people, you know, especially George, who loves sports, and he was so funny. And Jerry, who's obviously a very famous sports fan, too, at the Mets. At least a Mets fan is all he I loved, know. Yeah. He loved it. That it was the, – the thing is, as we're sitting here talking, to be able even, – even though my show was a national show, I didn't feel like I was – even in the airspace of these great people. Right. But sports was their vehicle to do the comedy. Oh, and if it anything, was, you're the celebrity. I was sort of the big deal for them, mm-hmm. which was really the same thing with Nick's. I see your show. That is crazy. It, it, yeah, it's wild. That's so, pretty rad. Yeah. Do you like getting up and being you every day, Roy? I enjoy my life. I, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. Forget Lou Love Gehrig. I'm the luckiest guy in the world. I Every dream that I've ever had, uh, truly did come true. Oh. Everyone has heartbreak and disappointments and loss, but I mean, on measure, nobody's had a better life than me. Career. I mean, I got to meet the greatest people. You saw some of the pictures mm. and uh, and McCartney and Elton John <laughs> and Springsteen, which is not in there, I don't think. But no, but I mean, hey, we man, all know over there. I know. Oh. I've seen your show. Hey, I enjoy it. Pets and I always watch you. You know, he's doing that. This, Do you see she, his face change every yeah. time? He morphs every time. He's well, a person. Well, it's not just an impression. What's funny is Patty Scalfo, who is his wife, she goes, this was in New York at his Broadway show. And she goes, you have no idea. I said, what? She goes, Bruce loves your show. I go, this is otherworldly, <laughs> man. It's like the boss is telling me that. So it was just... You know, and, and I was, not to drop a name, but I will, I was with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar because we were doing a tour. So it was me, Kareem, and Springsteen. And I'll never forget this. And, I'm, you know, I'm, you know, Kareem is like gigantic. Yeah. And Springsteen's thrilled. But then Kareem's sort of not into rock and roll that much. He's into jazz, so he sort of goes away. And it's just me and Bruce sitting there. Oh, yeah, man, I got to tell you, I really love the show, man. I just, oh, man, it just, it's got the, the heart. And he's doing all this stuff. And I realized, I told him, I said, you know, Bruce, honest to God, I think you're like the rocks, John Steinbeck. Mm. I think you're a guy who thinks writing first and the melody second. Mm-hmm. Oh, man, that's, that's right on, man. That's so true. You know, and then he starts telling me about it. And he's telling me about his hero, the Dave Clark Five. Come on. Yes. Because <laughs> they had the big drums. I remember. Of course. Yeah, he loved the Dave Clark Five. And he was sitting there talking to me. So... I mean, how do I get to meet Bruce Springsteen and talk about the Dave Clark Five with Bruce? I mean, and Elton John, Paul McCartney, Billy Joel, one other Billy Joel story. When I was in Student Entertainment Committee, I don't think he's in there, but uh, it was my job to pick up a young singer who just had a hit out called Piano Man Mm -hmm. at the airport, and it was Billy Joel. He does the show. The show is great. The show is over. i got to take him back to the airport. So I'm driving... Hey, man, I really enjoyed that show. Congratulations on your big hit record. I said, do you think you're going to be a star? I said, that, you know, whatever I was, 18, 19 years old. He goes, I don't know, a star, man. He goes, that's just a ball of gas. That's what a star is. There you is. go. Right? That's what he said. Yeah. And I, as I dropped him off at the curb and drove away, I said, well, I'll never hear from that guy again. Yeah, yeah. I've been there. <laughs> I've made a few of those calls. I'm telling you, man. It's, it's, <laughs> They're it's, never it's, right. It's truly amazing. Uh, Roy Firestone, can't thank you enough for being here My today. Pleasure, I hope man. you've enjoyed your experience. I really did. I have been delighted talking to you. I, I hope you, you can see it in my face. Thank it's very, you. very genuine. Well, I'm glad to have been part of this. You know, I'm, I'm, as I said before, I say this, I hope with humility, but, you know, to be able to write three books and have a musical CD out and to meet all these great people and all these sports figures, I mean, who's luckier than me? And, and I think and I hope that this, this new book, uh, that's what I'm talking about, manifests all my dreams and my, my storytelling and uh, some serious, some poignant, some funny, some surprising. But I love writing, too, and I, and I love doing all of this, and I want to appreciate you, you know, having me on the show, too. Oh, it's a delight. It's a delight. Please come back anytime. My pleasure. For goodness sake. I can't wait to read that. Oh, thank you. Thank so you. Excited. Mrs. Ryan, what do we have tomorrow? We've got, oh, tomorrow's Tony Callis 
from yeah. Callis Rensport, a Porsche guy. Oh, beautiful. Got a lot of Porsche stuff yeah. going on. You do here. eclectic stuff. You do stuff no, all, doesn't all over have to the be place. show business. And technically, we're more of a car show. We're technically more, wow. our audience is more of the, the Porsche and the car people. Now, you should Wednesdays get. Wednesdays are comedy. Wednesdays are comedy what, days. What well, about, I'm an appreciation of comedy for my whole life, I, and she I, made a career out of I it. I have never been a car person, but I see there's, there's a continuum here. Leno and Seinfeld and Letterman, these are all, but you know who the biggest car guy in the world was, was George Harrison. George Harrison loved Porsches and Formula. No kidding. The Beatle Formula guy? Formula One, you know, Formula One. Oh, I did know that, he was, yeah. He was best friends with Jackie Stewart and Mario <gasps> Andretti. Sir Jackie Stewart. It was very, very, very much important. He loved cars. And he the, loved art too, right? Art and art cars. Yeah, and, and he, of course, he loved you know the whole Zen of his faith, you know, and, and Kari Krishna and the whole thing. But I, I was really surprised when I interviewed Mario Andretti. I said, "Who would you say you trust more than anybody in the world?" He goes, "George Harrison." I mean. mm. And it was it's one of his closest Whoa. friends. But yeah. to you, it was out of the blue. Yeah, it was out of the That's blue. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, please come back anytime. Thank you, we brother. love you so much. Thank you. This is Ryan. We love you. Roy Firestone, we love you. Thank you. Uh, we love everybody at home. Please love one another. And we will be back tomorrow with Tony Callis from Callis Transport. Thank you for having me on. Let me sign this for you. you. Here. We do have not. I have one here. Oh, great. Oh, your first name again was? Just the letter J, believe it or not. J, that's right. J.